Let's start with a thought experiment, a pretty dark one actually. It all kicks off with this simple, almost forbidden question. What if you could actually perform an autopsy on the most influential figures ever conceived? Not just to see what's inside, but to understand what they really are. This is the provocative idea laid out by writer Alexander Nevzorov. And the procedure itself? Well, it would be brutally simple. A scalpel to expose the bone, a saw to open the cranium, and then the mind. The physical organ is right there. It's this very real, almost mechanical process to get to the root of a completely intangible idea. So, first up, dissecting an idea. But how in the world do you perform an autopsy on a fantasy? Right? You can't exactly put a myth on a steel table. The key, Nazorov argues, is to flip the whole procedure on its head. This is where it gets really clever. See, in a normal autopsy, we look at the brain to understand how a person lived. But here, we do the exact opposite. We take the known behaviors and characteristics of a figure, like Jesus or Satan, and we reverse engineer the only kind of brain that could have possibly produced them. From the life, we figure out the organ. And believe it or not, we have a mountain of data to work with. I mean, we're talking millennia of texts, art, and philosophical debates that have given us this incredibly detailed profile. We know how they allegedly acted, thought, spoke, and felt. All the raw material we need for our reconstruction is already there. All right, now for part two, the brain inside the gods. So, we perform our conceptual autopsy. We peel back all those layers of myth and dogma to get to the biological hardware hiding underneath. After all of that, what does the evidence reveal? What kind of unique, divine machinery would it take to perform miracles? or to hold all the secrets of the cosmos? The answer is, well, nothing special. Just a brain, a human brain. And this is the core finding, right here. The brain we reconstruct for Jesus isn't the brain of a god, it's the brain of the third century human who imagined him. The same thing goes for Satan. Their minds are simply reflections of their creators. And think about it, right? Any supernatural ability would have to have a physical, biological basis. Echolocation in bats requires specific brain structures. A platypus needs unique neural hardware to sense electricity. But in these so-called divine brains, we find none of that. No special wiring, no miraculous structures, just the standard issue brain of a primate. And here's the real kicker. Their knowledge is perfectly sealed within the era of their invention. There's no hint of future science, no mention of concepts that would be impossible for a third century mind to grasp. The divine blueprint is suspiciously, perfectly human. Which brings us to our third section. Genius, the final myth. See, this whole thought experiment, it was never really just about gods. That was just the setup. The real target is a much more modern and much more personal myth. The very idea of genius. In this view, genius isn't just about being really, really smart. It's become a kind of secular stand-in for the soul. It's this idea that some minds are so exceptional, so divinely inspired, that they must be exempt from the messy, animalistic story of evolution. You know, deep down, a part of us resists the idea that our thoughts, our creativity, our very consciousness are just the result of the same biological trial and error that gave us our spines and our thumbs. We want to feel special. So what does culture do? It creates its own saints. We just call them geniuses. Figures like da Vinci or Bach serve the exact same purpose. They're held up as proof that the human mind is something more than just meat. They become the guardians of our own perceived exceptionalism. Tracing the ghost. So what if we applied that same autopsy method to the idea of genius? What if we could trace its origins, just like any other biological trait? Nevzarov uses this really powerful metaphor. To understand a Boeing 737, you don't just stare at the finished product. No, you trace its evolution backwards, from the modern jet to the Wright Flyer to da Vinci's sketches to a primitive human trying to mimic a bird, all the way back to the very first feathered wing. Every complex thing has a simple evolutionary beginning. And that brings us to our final part, an animal spark. When we apply this same evolutionary rewind to the concept of genius, we arrive at the verdict, and it's an unsettling but totally logical conclusion. 
It isn't some ghost in the machine. It's not a message from the heavens. It is an emergent property of the grain's physical wiring and chemistry, nothing more. And the proof is as simple as it is, well, brutal. As Nevzorov starkly puts it, five minutes with something as simple as a kitchen mixer could have permanently deleted Newton's understanding of gravity. Why? Because that understanding wasn't floating in some ethereal plane. It was physically encoded in the fragile tissue of his brain. So, genius, then, is biology. It's an extension of the same animal history that defines our bodies. It's a remarkable feature, sure, but it's a feature of the organism, not some gift from outside of it. Which leaves us with a final question. After peeling back all the layers of myth, what are we really left with? Is human brilliance really evidence of something divine in us? Or perhaps the truth is something far more humbling, and in its own way, maybe even more beautiful. Not a divine gift, but a complex biological flicker. A simple animal spark in the darkness.